Making It Grow is brought to you in part by Santee Cooper, South Carolina's state-owned electric and water utility. More information on green power and energy conservation programs online at SanteeCooper.com. The South Carolina Department of Agriculture, reminding you that certified South Carolina agricultural products help make South Carolina grow. McLeod Farms in Macby, South Carolina. This family farm offers seasonal produce, including over 22 varieties of peaches. Glory Foods, celebrating Southern food with a soulful heritage. Glory Foods, a way of inviting South Carolina back to the dinner table. FTC Diversified, a proud part of your local communities, providing communication, entertainment, and security. Art Fields, a 10-day art competition in Lake City, South Carolina. Additional funding provided by International Paper. Good evening, folks, and welcome to South Carolina ETV's seriously fun gardening show, Making It Grow. I'm Tony Melton. I'm with Florence County Extension Service, and I'm here tonight standing in for, to, for Amanda, trying to help out to answer your personal gardening questions. So call in and give us that question so we can make you a better gardener. Also, we're going to travel over with Amanda over to Middle Sparrow Ranch. And we're going to look at their cows and sheep, and, and they also make some wonderful cheese. So let's go inside and see how we can answer your personal gardening question. Trace a lot. How you doing tonight, and how's the water work going? Good evening, Tony. It's great to be here, and it's also good to see you on the uh, other side of the studio in a little different role this evening. I still have rain in my rain or water in my rain barrels, and I know I was excited to see this morning that someone posted that they just installed 150 gallon capacity to rain barrels, and we're very surprised at how quickly they fill up. If you would like to come in the chat room tonight and talk about rainwater harvesting at your house or any other gardening questions you might want to uh, learn more about, just join us in the chat room. Go to the Making It Grow Facebook page. On the left side of the screen, click on the green Let's Talk icon. You're going to want to make sure you're using your web browser and not the mobile application. Once you click there, you'll be directed into the chat room. We already have six speakers in there with uh, I, what I anticipate to be great conversation. So click in the yellow box, log in with Twitter, Facebook, or your Rumble, Rumble Talk credentials, and we will be chatting very soon. Tony, back to you. Well, thanks, Teresa. And while we're talking about water, let's go over to the other side, change up things a little bit, and talk with Mr. Zachary Snipes. He's a county agent down around the low country, around Charleston. And I've heard you had a little bit of rain down there lately. Yeah, just a little bit, Tony. We, uh, the weatherman said it rained 25 out of 30 days in September. So wow. we are pretty saturated in the low country. I bet it really helped the disease out a lot. Oh, the diseases. I love the diseases, but when growers see me coming, they know it's bad news. It gives us a job to do. <laughs> That's right, we, job we get, security. We yep. get to answer yep. those questions, just like we're going to do tonight. Yes, sir. And we also have Miss Lori Watson. She's with Mill Creek Greenhouses over in Columbia. And you brought some beautiful plants. Just tell us a little bit about what you brought. Brought some wonderful natives and some little ifs, ands, and buts for the, just the little side gardens. So, wonderful okay. native plants that we're sort of wanting to get a little bit better into. Okay. I love those natives. Those yes. natives are real nice because a lot of people look for them all over the place and try to find them, and I'm glad you have them. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk a little bit later over in the, and talk about them a little bit and see what you brought. Okay. Okay, well, let's first of all, let's go over some show and tell. Any, uh, what can we have? Do you, I've got one thing here I wanted to bring in first and talk about more than anything else. Is you know, us gentlemen, we love to have our toys. And this is my brand new little toy here. This is my soil spade. And it's a nice one. You can stand up and you can take your soil samples all over the area you need without bending over and I hadn't even got it dirty yet. Zach. Oh man, that's great. No rust on that one. Yeah, yeah, it's usually they get really rusty and I'm just tickled to have it. And I wanted to tell folks too, this, whoops, I dropped my 
my soil sample bag and you don't want to do that. You want to fill it up nice to the line and bring it into the, our Clemson Extension office, wherever you're at. We have 46 in all the counties of, of the state. And you can bring it in, fill it up to that line, and send it off. And in about two weeks, it gets back with a nice soil sample, Zach. Yep. Best $6 you can spend. That's exactly right. I tell you, I like to know what's going on. And it's hard to guess That's what's right. going on in the soil and all without a soil sample. That's right. Lori, I'm sure you have to do things like that, and, and I bet around in the Columbia area you have to tell those folks to grow those nice plants. You have to tell them, take a soil sample. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, we've got a caller coming in, Charles in Buford. What's going on down in Buford, Charles? And, and tell us a little bit about your problem. Okay, uh, I'm, I've got a crepe myrtle that's uh, uh, not blooming every year. It only puts a couple blooms on, uh, but it puts on... 10 feet of, of growth, so what can I do to get that uh, crepe myrtle to bloom? Okay, we're going to have to go over here to Lori. I'm I, didn't, talking, I didn't hear that question. You didn't get it. I what didn't. it was is he has a crepe myrtle that's growing wonderfully, tall and big, mm -hmm. and not flowering. Is it in sun? Yeah, uh, is it in sun, Charles? Okay, well, Charles is gone, so we're going to, uh, it, it, I'm pretty sure it was in sun. And this probably, if it's growing well, it's usually in sun. Yeah. And how long has he had it planted, and did it pl uh, bloom last year? He said it grew 10 foot. It's over 10 foot. A lot of vegetative growth. So it's tall. Yep. A lot of vegetative growth. Maybe, or maybe some more fertilization. I mean, I know they're sort of heavy feeders, but usually they'll sort of do, they will bloom without fertilizer, but the water, added water, and some fertilizer would absolutely help okay. to a crepe myrtle. Okay. And uh, sometimes, I know for a fact, sometimes they come from seed, too. Mm -hmm. And if they come from seed, it takes many years for them to flower. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. Okay, now we've got Andy and Augusta. Andy, what's your problem, and how can we help you? Well, I, um, I got some Confederate jasmine that I want to uh, move because they have overgrown. And some people told me the best time to move them is probably middle of October. Okay. Is that correct? All right. You got some uh, Confederate jasmine, and he wants mm -hmm. to move them. Yes, and sir. he's thinking, well, October? Yeah. Maybe maybe a good time. This right now? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Probably about any time for Confederate jasmine. Okay. They're pretty tough plants. Mm -hmm. I would cut it back by half, though, or under half. Yeah. So it doesn't support as much foliage, mm -hmm. and it can root really well over the winter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the winter time is a good time to put mm -hmm. on those roots and be ready for the spring to come around. Absolutely. Because it can get hot here in the summertime. Oh, yes. Even on a Confederate jasmine, it even says the south, but it is still hot in the south right. here in Sumter, South Carolina. <laughs> it's pretty hot. Okay, next we have Mel in Bluffton coming. And Mel, what's your problem and how can we help you, please? Well, Tony, I got a question relative uh, to large patch or brown patch, as you call it. And um, I was wondering, you told me earlier that it came, it started in the fall, but it was, uh, you saw it in the spring. So when do I do a spray in the fall as far as trying to kill it? Is there something I see or is it just a time I do it? And the second question is uh, pre-emergent. How often do you put it down in the fall and how often in the spring? Okay, let's go to the second one first. And I'm going to throw it over to Zach. And, uh, he was talking about a pre-emergent. When pre should he do it um, in his lawn? Usually, uh, pre-emergent, it's, it's, it's a timing thing with weeds. So down in the Bluffton area, it's probably going to be um, a little later, probably in the season, than I would say the upstate. So you want to do it before the weeds germinate. So um, sometime around now, really? Sometime right about now would be the perfect time to do it. Um, and you want to make sure you get it out before they emerge. I mean, that's why it's called a pre-emergent. Um, so right about now is perfect. Okay. That's good. Uh, so, so go ahead and get that pre-emergent out. Maybe get it again in spring. Too. Get it again in the spring. Yeah. So Gotta get those summer weeds. Right. So you have two two different seasons of weeds. You have winter weeds and then and then spring or summer weeds. So if you can get a pre-emergent down um, in the in the winter and then again in the summer, it'll take care of most of your weeds throughout the season. 
Okay. He had another question, and it's a typical question I hear from everyone around. Is that it's called, they call it brown patch, but we actually this changed his name to large patch, and it is a disease, especially on warm season turf grass in South Carolina. And uh, Zach or Lori, which one of y'all want to take care? Zach, of that? I know that. Uh, Zach. Yeah. So brown patch is caused by fungus. Um, and generally it's in wetter or more damp areas um, uh, in your turf. So you want to put down a fungicide, um, a timely application before um, rains or real heavy events, if you can do that, or particularly when the grass is stressed or the turf is stressed. Um, a lot of times when plants are stressed, um, they're stressed and they need um, help from fungicides because it is easier for fungus and, and bacteria and pathogens to take them over. Okay. So. Yeah, it's a tremendous problem yep. here in South Carolina. Yep. But let's go over and talk to our water quality lady over there. She could probably tell us a little bit about all the water and all it's, the water that causes those problems like large batch. Teresa? Thanks, Tony. Well, you're right. Sometimes, you know, we sort of think that more water is better, but we can actually create more problems. Certain weeds are going to outcompete your turf if you provide too much water. Um, in addition, you can promote disease, especially fungal diseases. Um, so there's really a balance to play between just the right amount and not enough. Uh, we have 10 the number has grown since I looked last. Ten speakers and three viewers in the conversation. Um, people are really enjoying the fall weather that we've been having, uh, but it seems like not really too many gardening problems. So I know I have been having issues with something eating my cold crops, uh, especially loving the broccoli. Thought that I picked off all of the cross-striped cabbage worms, but something is still uh, making holes in the leaves. And you've probably heard us preach that you really have to identify the cold before you can do any kind of control. So I'm still out there observing, trying to figure out what's going on before I resort to um, any chemicals. I prefer to hand pick if I can. You know, a great resource if you're having problems with those cabbage worms or anything else on your fall veggie crops, you can go to Clemson's Home and Garden Information Center. And the easiest way to do that is clemson.edu slash H-G-I-C. And you can either browse by topic or there's also a search box. So you can just search in your topic. So if it's uh, worms, you can type that in. If it's uh, coal crops, you can type that in. And um, that will automatically search and bring up the topic that you're looking for. We have plenty of room in the chat room and plenty of time. So go ahead and join us. I think that you'll be pleasantly surprised. We're all very welcoming. Um, and even if you don't feel like you have a question, maybe you have an answer that someone is looking for. Let's check in with Tony and the panel. Well, thanks, Teresa. And we have another caller, Glenn from Cross Hill. Glenn, what's your problem? How can we help you? And just tell us a little bit about it so we can kind of understand it. Well, sir, I have a day lily bed that's about three feet wide, eight foot long, and it's been here for, I've been here 33 years, it was here when I got here. But uh, I have a problem with, uh, I don't know whether it's the correct name, but like Johnson grass coming up in it. Mm -hmm. okay. And I was wondering how to get rid of the Johnson grass without killing the day lilies. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah. Zach, how do you take care of grass inside of an ornamental? Or how, I think, which, which, I Lori? I think so, Lori should answer this. I didn't hear the question. Would you narrate it? Okay, he <laughs> has a daylily bed. I'm sorry. Oh, daylily bed. That's okay. That's fine. Well, he has a daylily bed that has Johnson grass growing up into it, and he wants to get rid of Johnson grass, you know, of course, and keep his daylilies. I mean, you could do it a couple of ways. You could go ahead and pull up, I don't know how many daylilies are, you can go ahead and pull up the daylilies, shake them off really well, wash them, make mm -hmm. sure the weed's not in there, get all that Johnson, use a, a Roundup type um, herbicide. And kill everything. Kill everything, and then wait for a couple of weeks and replant them. Um, but I would really wash those roots really well. Or you could just wait until the, it's dormant, the daylilies are dormant, mm -hmm. cut them back, make sure there's no green. I, I don't know if the Roundup would probably hurt them, but it would get, kill some of that grass. Yeah, usually when Roundup hits the soil, it deactivates. Yes. Yeah. And I wanted to mention one thing, and it's a possibility, Vantage, that a lot of, uh, that's available to homeowners. It's available, and you can put it right over the top of the daylilies, and it will kill grassy weeds. 
Okay. Not nut, nut sedge or nut grass is what most people call it. It won't kill that, but it'll kill most of your grassy weeds. But it can go right over the top of the daylilies and kill the Johnson grass. Okay. Okay. Well, up next, we're going to go out to a ranch with Amanda. It's, she went out this past week and she got to see some beautiful cows and sheep and pigs and, you know, I think it's beautiful because I grew up on farms like that and seeing animals like that is one of the most beautiful things I know. And then she has some beautiful, nice cheese out there. Cheese and you know me, I love to eat. And so I, I love to have some nice cheese and she had some great cheese out there on Middle Sparrow Ranch. We're in Sardis, South Carolina, visiting with Alice and Earl Baller at Middle Sparrow Ranch. Earl, how did you decide to leave the corporate world and end out here way out in the country? Well, basically, um, you know, I always had a love for animals. Um, grew up on, on a small farm, um, had animals all my life, um, worked on dairy farms, even owned another dairy farm uh, up north. Uh, and we decided to get this piece of ground and um, wanted to try to make a living off the piece of ground. So uh, we just decided that this was kind of the thing we wanted to do. Um, and the basis of this right now is a wonderful herd of cattle. What kind are they and why did you choose that? Uh, we have Jersey cows, uh, all registered Jersey cattle. And the reason we chose those uh, uh, type of cattle is because they graze well very efficient grazers um, and they handle the South Carolina heat very well. Uh, That's much better, plus. Yeah, much better than other breeds. Um, in fact, when it's 95 or 98 degrees, they'll still be out there grazing on the grass and, uh, and seem to actually enjoy it, so. What's the quality of their milk like? Uh, well, it's very high butterfat content, Ooh. high solids uh, milk, so it goes very well with our cheese making. Um, and actually, we, we just started making butter not too long ago. Uh, it's a very rich, creamy, sweet kind of butter that we make out of that. So the Jersey really works well for, for the kind of products that we're making. Alice, I understand that you're not much of a milkmaid, but you've decided. <laughs> <laughs> but cheese is something that you've really gotten interested in. Tell me about the different kinds of cheeses that you're making. We, we're making cheddar cheese, and we make a farmer's cheese, Monterey Jack, and Pepper Jack, and all of them are, are aged, in, you know, 60 days plus, and um, we hard wax them, but like red wax, yellow wax. So when I looked in that little cooler, what looked like some kind of beautiful wedding cake, actually that is a whole piece of cheese. That's a whole round hoop cheese. And the aging, does that bring out the flavors? What's the purpose? Uh, legally, to sell raw cheese, we have to age it 60 days, but uh, it's better to age it four to five months because you tend to get more of the flavor as it ages. The longer it's just like cheddar cheese, if it's aged over a year, it's a real sharper cheese. So the longer it ages, the sharper it gets. And you've got a room where you can age the cheese, yes, so you keep your cheese aging to get the very finest flavor. Yes, ma'am, we do. Now, you've told me that recently you decided that maybe you'd try a different kind of cheese. What are these? Yeah, we, we decided to go with a, uh, a softer cheese, which is a fromage. It's a spreadable cheese. We have a plain fromage, and it's just uh, plain, and you can have it with preserves, or um, I like it with honey. Mm. Um, I also have a garden herb, uh, and it's a tomato, onion, basil. And then we have a spicy one. It's uh, chili chipotle with uh, chili peppers, so it's got a little kick to it. So... Um, you know, a, a, a lot of people like the little spicy. Oh, that's true, everybody likes that little yeah. bit of tag. Now, how often a day do you spend milk and how long do you spend milking? Uh, it takes us, because we have a really small setup, um, it takes us about two hours, two hours in the morning and two hours in the evening to milk. Um, milk them twice a day, every day. Uh, and then we make cheese, you know, depending on our volume of milk, uh, two to three times a week. Earl, I understand that when you make cheese, you have a byproduct that really there's not a lot of demand for, but y'all have found a way to incorporate that into your life here on the farm. Explain that to us, please. That's right. We um, basically, from the, from the cheese making process, uh, you end up with whey, 
Uh, it's basically the liquid that comes out after the uh, milk coagulates and you get the curds out to make the cheese. Uh, and then that way, uh, we needed something to do that with, you know, to use. And we wanted a way to use it, so um, we got some pigs and, and they love it. So we're, we're feeding some pigs with that. And then, of course, you know, we keep expanding the pigs because we keep expanding the, the, the cheese making. We have to have something to do with the whey, but they really like it. So. And these are free range pigs who they're are They're pastured, outside. that's correct. Yeah, they're pastured pigs um, outside all the time on the dirt. Um, basically, 90% uh, of their diet is the whey from the cheese. So I bet they have a delicious flavor. They do. Uh, it, it definitely gives the pork a distinct flavor, um, kind of a creaminess, mm -hmm. I guess you would say. Um, so yeah, we, everyone seems to like it. And then um, I see that um, you still have a soft heart for animals. You said that you've got some sheep out there, and I don't know that there's much use for those sheep. <laughs> They're not. They're just, you know, they're just here for show. Later on in the spring of next year, we're hoping to start field trips. And so having them here will, will expand, you know, the petting zoo part of it. So that's why uh, I kind of got them here, too. So, yeah. Alice and Earl, we are excited about what y'all have accomplished, the passion that you have, the quality of the products that you're offering here. And if people would like to know more, what's the best way to find out about you? They can check out our website, it's www.middlesparrowranch.com, or they can find us on Facebook, just Middle Sparrow Ranch on Facebook. Well, we've had a grand visit, and um, we now want to go out here and meet some of those wonderful, nice girl cows. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you for coming. We appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Yes, Amanda told me about an open house they're having October 11th and 10 to 4. be a great time to go out and introduce your family to cheap cows and some great cheese. And you can go in and do some tasting. That's what I like to do. I like to taste. So I'm looking forward to getting out there and going to Middle Sparrow Ranch. Okay, we've got some more people in the calling in. William from Columbia is calling in. Hey. Um, yes, how can we help you, William? Yeah, I got a question. I planted a, uh, planted some cotton seed in my front yard, and they grew up, and the ones in the ground didn't do too good, but I put one in a pot, and the one in the pot did really good, and I was wondering if I could bring that thing inside and have it make cotton longer over the cold months. Is that something that happens? Okay, he has a cotton plant. He will, uh, I know y'all are not cotton or row crop specialists here, but uh, cotton is a neat plant. I mean, oh, yeah. it's South Carolina, Beautiful, I mean, yeah. king cotton. King mm -hmm. cotton. We, we really have a lot of cotton here. And cotton is a long season plant. And what I'm thinking myself, what might have happened, is he had it planted in the, in the yard, and if it got a lot of rain and got too much water, cotton is a dry, kind of a dry season plant. It's a hibiscus family. You, you know, it's, it's in the hibiscus family where you can uh, have a lot of ornamentals in that family, too. And if he brought it inside, it wouldn't get enough sunshine because it likes the warmth and the heat and the sun. It's a hot weather plant. And really, once it forms the bowls and sets them, that's the cotton you got. They, they, most cotton we grow in South Carolina is actually determinate, which means it stops to grow up. And then it puts on all those bulbs and sets that cotton beautiful wide into harvest, folks. I love cotton. Can he collect the seed? Uh, the, Put it out for next year? Well, yes, you can collect seed. Okay. I want, want one thing, though. <laughs> cotton is in a boll weevil eradication program. Oh. And it actually should not be grown at home in an ornamental situation like that because it needs to have those little traps. You can, you've probably seen them little green traps sitting mm -hmm. around the cotton field. They stick on a little, little stick sticking up and it has this little green trap. Well, that actually is the boll weevil eradication program. And you should be in that if you're growing cotton. So we don't recommend growing ornamental cotton. $40 fee? Yeah, it's only a small amount, yep. and it's total fee for, but you're supposed to be in yep. the bow readable eradication program, folks, mm -hmm. if you grow cotton. 
So now, we've got Bob over in Wadmala, which I know Zach would probably know oh, yeah. where Wadmala is because it's down his part of the state. Uh, how can we help you, Bob? Hey, how y'all doing? This is Bob from Wadmala. I got a question for Mr. Snipes here. All okay. right. I got this veggie garden out back, and I got all these critters keep tearing everything up. And I got a fence up, but they still keep getting in. And I was wondering if there's anything I could put out that keeps them from eating up everything I get out in my backyard. I mean, just short of me sitting out there with a the boat. <laughs> yeah, good question, Bob. Yeah. Um, we, I've seen that in, in a lot of the farms I visit, a lot of the farms I work on. Um, unfortunately, um, there's not much you can do. Do you? I'm wondering if you have a fence around it. Um, deer he can he jump. Did. Said he had a fence. Said he had a fence. Deer can even jump over a 10-foot high fence. Um, so you may want to put some um, electrical voltage on the fence, um, you know, to give them a little shock. It won't hurt them, but it just kind of keeps them out. Um, some people use human hair. They collect human hair from barber shops and put it out. Um, and I've heard of people using chrysanthemums um, around their, their garden. So mm -hmm. do you have any other thing? Well, uh, I've heard of the people putting up soap, yep. putting up dryer cloths, hanging them in trees. Mm -hmm. And, you know, things like that, what it, that they think is people's there. Right. They think people are there. And in a home like that, I, actually, you can actually use a sprinkler with a motion detector on. Mm -hmm. And every time they come by with a motion detector, it sprinkles them and they run off. So yeah. it works pretty good. So next we have Joyce in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. And that's another down your way All there, right. Zach. They just need to come in the office. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, how can we help you, Joyce? Well, um... I have a Myers lemon tree that is outside, and it's about five feet tall, and I've had to move it from where it was this winter. In fact, I've called y'all before. I've had it about five years, and I have gotten lemons, maybe 16 to 20 each year, and this year when the, the bad weather came, um, it just, you know, really I had to cut it back a lot. Well... I have not gotten one bloom on the lemon tree. And I've put the citrus fertilizer out a couple times this year. And so I'm just wondering if y'all have heard this from other people or am I going to get any blooms or what I should do now? Okay, Joyce, has in the past, has it bloomed and fruited? Yeah, she said she got... It did. I, I had, I had uh, blooms and I had, sometimes I'd have like 16 and then I'd... One year I had like 20 lemons, and okay. but I've had to move it all the way around my house to get it to where the the cold wind won't get it. You know what I'm saying? It's it's been a challenge. Oh yeah. But they, if you're living, it looks assisted. good. I, I just have some leaf miners on it right now. Okay. Okay, which one of you are the citrus person? No, I'm not a citrus. Stan Stan McKenzie's a citrus man. Oh yeah, he's a citrus man. But um. I would say, was it outside when it flowered? Did she have it outside when the spring came, early spring? Yes. Because sometimes they like a cold dormancy, and I know it dropped all its leaves. I think she said, I mean. It was just cold this past winter, yeah. is the bottom line. It was just yeah. tough, and it was hard to bring a citrus plant from mm -hmm. that. What do you think, mm -hmm. Zach? Yeah, I think so. And, and what we've seen this year a lot, um, a lot of citrus trees are grafted. And the top part of the plant, or the scion of the plant, died in the actual, in, from the rootstock. We're getting the, the other trees, and they don't. A lot of them don't flower as much. Okay. So, yeah, it's tough to grow citrus in South Carolina, yep. but you know, it takes those really hardy people to grow yep. that hardy citrus yep. and try to uh, get it to produce in our South Carolina cold winters, folks. Okay, we have another caller, Lori in Greenville. How can we help you, Lori? Yeah, hi. I have two beautiful gardenia bush, bushes in the front of my yard, and they need to be pruned because they're by the front porch. And um, last summer, well, we just moved to the house, and last summer I tried to prune them after they bloomed, and then this summer I didn't have many blooms. So I'm trying to figure out when I'm supposed to prune these gardenias. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Laura. Well, Lori, tell us about the gardenias. I would... I would prune it right before spring growth starts. That's when I would do it, when, just when it starts to flush. Because mm -hmm. it's a middle bloomer in the kind summer. Kind of middle of the year. So yeah, it's, an, of it's on new wood. So I don't think it would affect um, any of the bloom. But I would do it right, after this, right before spring in the flush mm -hmm. and throw a little bit of fertilizer around it. Not too much. You don't want to get it too heavy. But 
Those white flies are bad over yeah. too oh, on, yeah. on gardenias, Zach. Oh yeah, they're tough. They're tough. They love a gardenia. And I, I love the smell of a gardenia myself too, though. They're a wonderful plant. So I'm sure the white flies are drawn to it. Oh yeah. And she probably needs to treat for those mm -hmm. too. Yes. All right, we've got Z and Fountain Inn next. Z, how can we help you? Well, I was like a little bit uh, odd down here. We have a mystery sort of on our hands down here and Fountain Inn. We live in the country and the other day I went down to my neighbor's in between my house and her house, but something had went through there for about a 16 by a 10 foot wide and just cut the ground like a knife with a knife all over uh, on the leg of the grass was just laying on top of the ground. And then in other places around it, there would be brown places round, and it looked like something stayed on fire, but the grass wasn't burnt. And then it got weighed about 10 foot the morning and it'd do it again. And I mean, it was just, I had tore that all the pieces. I know it don't have anything to do with the garden, but it has something to do with the ground, but we can't figure out what's done it. Okay, Zach, I believe you got an idea. Uh, I don't well, have any idea. Z, my parents are from uh, Belton, South Carolina, and they just recently have had um, a lot of hog problems. And so they've had some ground in their front yard just overnight. Um, torn Chilled up, up tore up. Tore up. It looks like somebody came through with a with a disc harrow. So that may that, to me that's what it sounds like. It, it'd help if we had some pictures and you could bring take it into your local county office. Uh, we might could help you identify it. Okay, all right. Yeah, you can look for those prints. They're they look yep. like a deer to a certain extent, but just yep. a little bit different. So you have to know what you're looking for. Yep. Yes. Okay. Well, let's go up to Teresa and see what's going on in the chat room. Thanks, Tony. We have been having a grand time in the chat room as usual, but I wanted to take this opportunity to share a photo with you. Um, you've heard me say that I live vicariously through the photos that are shared, and I was very envious when I saw this beautiful monarch that stopped long enough for a picture. You know, monarchs are special butterflies. They make a very long migration all the way down to Mexico, and this is actually peak migration season for the latitude of the Sumter area, so a great time to be spotting them as they make their way from here down to Mexico. And if you're interested in learning more about monarchs and their migration or um, their overwintering areas, you can go to monarchwatch.org. And uh, this is probably small on your screen, but you can actually see the fall migration pattern, how they fly uh, down sort of the coast and over to Mexico. And that's on monarchwatch.org. And remember, um, just like the, the person who posted that photograph, if you plant for our pollinators, you will certainly be rewarded. Tony, back to you. Well. Thank you, Teresa, and, and those pollinators, you know, they're the workers of agriculture, really. They do a lot of work out there, helping us have all different types of crops. Well, not only Amanda, but also Dr. John could not be here tonight. So I decided to bring my own mystery plant. And this plant is a little bit of a kind of an oldie, a good, let's say good oldie, old timey plant. Kind of, you know, I, I'm kind of a little old timey too, so. It's so a little old timey. It has a beautiful sunflower type flowers and then I have them all over the top. Uh, it's about 10 or 12 foot tall, usually when it grows. So I couldn't bring in the whole entire plant. So I just brought the top, but I did bring in some of the tubers that are underground and grow kind of a weird shape, kind of Sputnik looking things, mm -hmm. just kind of unusual. Any, Either of y'all got any ideas what this might be? I don't want to steal the show. Oh, go ahead. You can steal it. <laughs> it's we, an artichoke. An artichoke. A but I don't know artichoke. how to pickle them. You don't? No. Yeah. I tell you, the first thing you have to do, you have to wash them real well because they all do little notches in there and everything. It holds a lot of, of uh, dirt inside there. I have one grower that says I, I take them and put them in a cotton sack and throw them in the washing machine and wash them up. <laughs> wow. And get the dirt off of them so they'll pickle up real well. My daddy, this is one of those things my daddy loved because he loved to relish. You know, and you, you have them, they produce these nice tubers during this time of year and you take it and make a nice relish and then you eat the relish all winter long and it gives you something fresh actually to eat from the garden. 
and you don't have to plant them but once. That's it. <laughs> they are kind of a weed. You're yeah. exactly right. Yeah. They take over. Actually, they love sandies. Sorry, soil. No mm -hmm. fertilizer much or anything, and they mm -hmm. just kind of just take over. And but they do make an excellent relish and and, and a pretty flower and a beautiful flower. Mm -hmm. Actually, I have it near my house, and it actually it's a beautiful flower. And um, so uh, we have another caller coming in. We have uh, ML from Westminster, South Carolina. Uh, ML, uh, how can we help you? Uh, I have a zoysia grass in my yard. I got a large yard. It's uh, probably a half an acre. I've got something it's killing the grass and it's in little circles from the size of a baseball to a basketball. Someone told me that it was army worms. I don't see any worms. I've looked around, I've sprayed it with different stuff and it just, they just keep killing my grass. I want to know what I can do to get rid of these things. Okay. So that's what it is. Okay, you have, you have dead areas in your zoysia yard about as big as a plate or something along that line. You have any idea, Zach? Yeah, I think the first thing you need to do is really identify what's there. It could be army worms or it could be a fungal disease that's in the soil. Um, one way to test for army worms and other types of grubs is you can take a tin cup and sink it in the ground and fill it up with water. Within a few minutes, if there's any type of insects that are feeding on it, um, they'll come up to the top and they'll float on top of the grass and it'll kind of pull them out of the soil. Um, and that'll tell you if you have army worms or any type of grubs. Um, if it's not that, then it may be a fungal disease, um, and he can always take a patch of that soil or turf into his local extension office. Um, you typically want a little bit of the diseased soil and a little bit of the healthy um, turf um, mm -hmm. on the edge. You can send it off to the plant problem clinic. That sounds good. That's, that's, that's a good way to tell. That's what you need to do is know right. what you got. Right. That's the first thing to do to answer your problem is right. find out what your it, problem especially, is. Especially before you start spraying because we want to really identify what we have before we spray. Yeah. Teresa will get on us real <laughs> bad. You start telling folks to, to spray when they don't need to because right. that does harm the environment. So we're going to go over and send it over to Teresa. What's going on in the chat room? Why, thank you for being environmentally minded, Tony and Zach. I thought we'd stick with the lawn theme since we were just talking about zoysia grass. So this photograph was submitted by Marsha, and she said, what in the world is going on? And it sort of looks like the Smurfs have taken up residence here. And if you look closely, you should be able to see this arc of darker green grass. And this is what's known as a fairy ring. And it occurs when nutrients are being released by those fungi. And, uh, uh, you know, serving as a stimulus for plant growth. Now, the good news is fairy rings will usually go away on their own, at least of this type, but the bad news is it can take many, many years. If you'd like more information about fairy rings or possible control options, of course, you can talk to your local extension agent or you can uh, go on to Clemson's Home and Garden Information Center and type in fairy rings. Now, let's check in with Tony and Lori at the side counter. Well, thanks. Thanks, Teresa, and, and we appreciate you telling us how to answer that problem with fairy rings. That was very interesting because it is a big problem. I see them all the time, and I'm glad to have Miss Lori Watson from Mill Creek Greenhouses here to show us these beautiful plants that you've brought, and I want to, let's talk about this first one, and it has a little bit of a Clemson tie into this it name. It does. It's Tiger Time. Tiger Time. Yeah. I like that beautiful orange. It goes right it along is. my it shirt. It is. It is beautiful. Orange goes anywhere in the garden. That's true. It does show, show out. It's really it what it does. It, does. it is, makes you look, really. Mm -hmm. Really. And tell us a little bit about it. It's probably been the best daylily we've had. Um, there's, mm -hmm. It was a beautiful midsummer bloomer yeah. with a lot of repeat bloom. And then about two, three weeks ago, it started budding and showing this flowers. But the most important thing, this never got any rust or aphids on it. It is clean. Yeah, it? It's, it's, it's beautiful. I mean, this has been in our greenhouse since early June. So. Does, it stays there pretty much wintertime mm -hmm. and, and the, all, and, and yeah. it makes a little bit of interest in the wintertime. Mm -hmm. yeah. Dark green foliage just stayed really clean. Nice. We have this one, this plant here. This is uh, one of my favorites because it was one of my mother's favorites. And she loved the billiards. She had the old-timey tall ones. Uh -huh. You know, they got up about eight foot tall. 
and the bees and the bumblebees and the butterflies just loved it. But this is an abelia that is a little bit unusual. It is. Um, they, they're coming off of a lot of cultivars of abelia that are very garden worthy rather than your old grandmother's abelia. Oh, yeah. And um, this one's called Belladonna. So and, how tall? Um, it's just three by three. And if you get real close, you can see the red stems on it. Oh, that's great. We, I love those. Yeah, red. we sort of paired it with the crimson fire lure petalum at the greenhouses. It's really pretty. Oh, yeah, I like those red stems. Kind of show out. Yeah, Ooh. and, and it's a pure white bloom. Yeah, pure so, white. Yeah. And really makes a wonderful show. And it won't cover up those four foot windows or no, three foot windows. No, you would windows. probably not have to touch this for a long time, prune it. Okay. So. I like that. You know, yeah, the easier little, the better. Little pruning, <laughs> very little. And you've got another plant over here that is a little different for this part of the state. Yeah, and this is new to us. Um, I was excited to get it. It's a native Pieris. Mm -hmm. Most Pieris are um, more mountainous and mm -hmm. like the cooler weather. This one actually is only native to the southeast, which is um, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Louisiana. You mean it grow down into yes, Louisiana? Yes, that heat. Oh. Yeah, it's a high heat, high humidity um, type Pieris, but in its native habitat, it will grow like a vine. So if it's, you know, in the swamps, it will go up like a, a cypress or a gum tree. In your own garden, it will probably only get about three by three. Oh, I like the three yeah. by three plant. And, and really, that's what most plants get. It yeah. might tell you it's a drawer, but it's oh, usually yeah. three by three or four by four or somewhere in that realm. But it blooms in the winter, early spring. So it's a great plant, evergreen. Yeah. I was walking around my yard this, this evening looking for things to bring, you know, I always do that for a show and I smell something that smells so great and I had to go find out what it was and it was a ginger lily. Mm -hmm. And it, I had the white one and it smells so wonderfully. And you have one over here that has a unusual flower, but you yeah. said don't, don't. It, no fragrance. No fragrance. Oh. So I know, but this one, I mean, this will get a foot and oh, it's wow. orange and I saw it in the trial and garden. It shows right. out It's it. beautiful. Yeah. It's beautiful. And the corn, it looks like a corn stalk, actually. Be a nice I think plant dark behind green. some other short. Yeah. I mean, like this Yeah, put yes. some cobalt blue in front of that. Yeah. Oh, wow, <laughs> that's a good idea. Yeah, very good. And then out here in the front, you have another, one of the toughest plants I know there is, and that's one of your honeysuckles. Mm -hmm. It's not one of those invasive honeysuckles. No. This is a native. Right. No smell, no fragrance, but it has repeat, continuous, almost bloom on it. This one, this, uh, um, cultivar is drop more scarlet mm -hmm. and it's more of an orange and not sort of a red mm -hmm. but um it's continuous and repeat bloom is beautiful and it's sort of a cross between two natives yeah a lot of people call them coral honeysuckles right they are a beautiful plant tough as nails mm -hmm. they are really tough and then next to it you have a plant that my mother loved which is the, i love the old wild gila it was kind of a little bit of straggly and it uh -huh. had some yellow flowers but this one beautiful yeah it's called Rigelia aurea, and in the spring it comes out with gold leaves. Gold, um, wow. And even in shade it'll stay gold. Now the heat might revert it maybe in you know, early July to some greener, but still it's beautiful now. So after the spring bloom, you cut it back and you have your fall bloom. In shade, it's a little more open. It'll get about five by five in your garden, but you, all can, you can prune it though after that first bloom to keep it a little bit shorter. I bet those flowers are beautiful, but in front of that yellow. Oh yeah, oh, the gold leaves, yeah. yes, yeah. Beautiful. And then over to the side here, you have a spirea, which we used to have the old uh, uh, shoe buttons spirea around the house, and, and it was just so beautiful. But this is a native. It's a native, and we picked it up actually Friday. Um, I, they said this native nursery we went to have two spireas right next to each other. This one's latifolia, but this is the one that attracts the butterflies and the bees. And it'll get about two to three feet tall in your garden, midsummer bloomer through frost. But what you want to do after it blooms is just sort of keep cutting it, and it comes out with these beautiful blooms. Oh, just keep shearing it back in it. But keep wonderful flying. native. It likes a little, at here it would like afternoon shade and kept moist, roots moist. So oh, It likes moisture. Most of these spireas mm -hmm. like drier type conditions. Right. This yeah. one would like a little bit more moisture. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Right, nice native plants. I yeah. love these natives. I mean, I'm learning about them. A lot of people are looking for these these natives, and yes. I'm glad you have them. Mm -hmm. I thank you, Miss Lori, for coming and showing us these beautiful, beautiful plants. And so let's go back over to Race and see what's going on in the chat room.
Thank you, Tony. Very interesting segment, as always. You know, our latest conversation in the chat room has been about those pesky deer and how they want to come into people's yards and uh, eat up all the plants in their garden. And there are several different ways that you can try to uh, reduce the damage done by deer, one of which is fencing, uh, some temporary fencing of the electric kind. Uh, it's inexpensive, easy to construct, um, and, and only has to be there temporarily while you're having a problem. There are lots of uh, different strategies for doing that, and again, you can find a fact sheet on Clemson's Home and Garden Information Center. Uh, in addition to fencing, uh, keeping the deer out, there are also uh, frightening tactics, but those usually have to be started as soon as you see the deer are causing problems, because once they establish a pattern of coming into your yard, um, it's hard to deter them, um, sort of like like when you have a habit, right? It's hard, hard to break habits. There are also repellents that can be used, but you have to be very careful if you are wanting to use something in a vegetable garden. Most of them cannot be used on edibles. But if you have a question, feel free to call your local extension office. Now let's check in with Tony and the panel. Well, thanks, Teresa. And in honor of Miss Amanda, I had to wear a hat tonight. And instead of a frilly looking hat, though, I had to wear my boss baseball cap. You know, just gentlemen, we have to have our baseball cap. And I had to put some sweet potatoes on there because now's that time of year, Zach. Mm -hmm. Everyone's looking for sweet potatoes. Mm -hmm. Digging taters. Digging taters. That's exactly <laughs> right. And having sweet potatoes to, to, for the, all winter long, actually. They can be kept all winter long. But... Uh, I love my sweet potatoes. I grew up Super food. Yeah, yeah, and uh, we kept them all year long and had sweet potatoes. But Mary in Chester is calling now, and Mary, how can we help you in Chester? I have amaryllis that I've had for years, and they've stopped blooming. I wanted to know if there was a way that I could make them bloom again. Amaryllis. Amaryllis. I know the song, Amaryllis, but <laughs> Amarilla. Yeah, Texas, but uh, Amaryllis, uh, which one of y'all? Oh, Lori? I'll give it my Amaryllis? best shot, but is it in the pot or in the ground? Is it in is the, it the pot, pot or, the or in the ground, Mary? Okay, uh, she in the ground. It's in the ground, in the ground. so it's outside? Yes, ma'am. I'm um, going to take this hat off. Yeah, that's, go that's ahead. It. I'm still sitting here. You laugh at me too much. <laughs> I, I'm disturbing your concentration here. I mean, if it's in the ground, it's going to have its dormant period. Um, I don't know. I would probably dig it up and try it indoors. Mm -hmm. That's what I, that's what I would think guess to do. But okay. yeah, I think it's a good idea. I mean, yeah. they need a dormant period um, mm -hmm. and a little bit of a dry period to start blooming. But I don't know in the ground if it's going to get. You know, it'll go through its cold period. So mm -hmm. it needs to be probably kept warm and brought inside, and then it'll start flushing out again. Okay. Okay. I love amaryllis. Oh yeah. And big beautiful flowers. Oh, say, okay, we have Dave in York, South Carolina, calling. Uh, Dave, how can we help you? Well, good evening. I'm enjoying the show. Um, I have a pot of carpus that uh, has done well. It's about four or five years old. And lately, it, it, this season now, it's looking real spindly, uh, yellowing on the leaves, which I thought probably was iron deficiency, and so put some of that. But it... Um, I don't know if that's uh, just a, a phase it's going through or what. It's it's looked healthy before, but now it looks really um, uh, you know spindly and and doesn't look well. Oh, podocarpus. Uh, he has a problem with his podocarpus. I love them. They grow kind of up. Yeah. And I, some people prune them a lot and make them into a little ball and all. Oh, I just love the loose growth that they grow up and just kind of fall over. This beautiful plant. Uh, how about about his photocarpus? It sounds like it's in the shade, it's it's being spindly. Shade. Yeah, I think they do a little bit better in some sun. A little bit of sun, maybe yeah. a little part shade. The yellowing, I would just be sort of careful. If it's on the inside of the plant, that's sort of a natural thing, sort of coming mm -hmm. into cold, mm -hmm. it's going to shed some leaves. But um, if it's on the outside of the plant, um, I'd probably take it to the extension office and just sort of say, but. Um, because you can't really tell in a podocarpus the veining in the leaf. Usually if the vein is green, it's a little carotid and needs a little bit of iron in it. Mm -hmm. But um, it's sort of hard on a podocarpus being sort of that needle-like conifer look. So. Okay. Well, or soil tested. Yeah. 
That's right. Get that soil tested. Y'all, you know, <laughs> you know, as a candidate agent, we have to say that because that is, it is very It is. Important. It is very, because it, it might not be taking up iron or something else. That's right. So. That's right. Um, also, I was thinking, too, maybe too much rain, too. Too oh, yeah, that's Any, true. Like Anything that stresses a plant out, you know, yeah. they kind of, it kind of compounds on itself, you know, yeah. cold and then too much rain and then you get heat stress. So it could be a combination of a bunch of factors. That's usually what it is. Yep. Exactly right, Mr. Zach. Well, uh, just kind of thank you for bringing all these plants, Miss Lloyd. They're beautiful. Love it. And, and let's talk about maybe one more of them. I know you've got some beautiful. How about, uh, let's talk about this orange flowering fragrant tea olive. Tea olive. Yeah. I love tea olives. That's one of my favorite plants because this time of year you have that nice, wonderful smell. And, uh, but this is an orange flower. An orange. And it, it's not going to be as prolific a bloomer as the white one. Um, probably it's not as fragrant either, but you can't, you have to die to see the orange next to that green foliage. It's almost the color of your shirt, so it's just real pretty and different. And they're a little bit slower growing. Okay. I love the uh, Calicanthus oh, Michael Lindsay. Right beside it, yeah, the, yeah. the one right here beside yeah. it. It's a beautiful plant. And it's a great yeah. cultivar, the Michael Lindsay is. As a, as a select, I mean, well, selection of a native plant, the Michael Lindsay. I love the, it's, it's a tough plant, too. Mm -hmm. It's really a really tough plant. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you for coming. Thank you for bringing these plants. I mean, it's just beautiful. And, and this made the whole set just so beautiful. And I want to uh, tell everyone, before we forget here, is that this coming Saturday, the Making It Grow team will be down in Walterboro, that's this coming Saturday, October the 18th, we'll be at the second annual Colleton Fiber Fair. And we'll be there and we'll be answering your questions. I know I'll be there and Vicki will be there and Miss Amanda will be there. And so that'll be this coming uh, uh, Saturday at 11 a.m. We'll be there at 11 o'clock. So uh, that's a, just come on down to the uh, to the water barrel, and we'll be glad to answer some more of your questions because that's really what making it grow is. And it is, is people have their individual problems, and I find that out every time I go and talk to people all over the state that they want their individual problem answered, and that's why making it grow has really been a favorite show of a lot of folks. Okay, uh, we're gonna go back over to Race and see what's ending in the uh, chat room there. Thanks, Tony. We had a great night in the chat room. We still have 15 speakers and three viewers, so 18 people carrying on conversation, and uh, it's always a fun time. You know, if you like making it grow, you would probably like your day. That is a live call-in radio show. It's aired every day at noon, Monday through Thursday. You can listen from your vehicle, or you can also listen online at scetv.org. Wanted to let you know, you, everyone knows that I'm a big animal lover, and so this this Wednesday, it's going to be about your pet's health, and you can hear Dr. Glenn Bierencott of Clemson University's Department of Animal and Veterinary Sciences and his guest, Dr. Bobby Long, from the 24-hour Magnolia Veterinary Hospital in hospital in Anderson and they're going to address listeners questions about uh, your pet's health. So if you have any questions feel free to listen and give them a call. So it's just like making it grow only different topics. And don't forget you can post your questions, your photos on our Facebook page 24 hours a day, seven days a week and we'll do our best to get you a timely response. But we do just have a few people um, and often have to consult with others. Now let's check back in with Tony. Well, thanks, Teresa. I really appreciate that. And thanks to those folks that come into the chat room because it's all, everyone together. And we're all answering questions and we're all doing a great thing for the folks of South Carolina and answering their gardening questions because that makes South Carolina a more beautiful place. And so I just want to thank you, Zach. Yes, sir. For Pleasure coming to be to, here. Uh, from the Low Country. Yes, sir. We'll appreciate it. And what's going on down there that you need to go back and take care of? Uh, we got to go scout some fields tomorrow. Um, we have some broccoli and cauliflower um, growers. And um, so, so I'm going to hang out with some growers and see what's going on and try to address their problems tomorrow. Okay. Yep. Thank you, Zach. Yes, sir. Appreciate yes, sir. it. Now, Lori, I can't tell you how much I appreciate all these plants. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about your greenhouses and how they can get in touch with you. 
We're Mill Creek Greenhouses in Columbia. We're on Leesburg Road. Um, our phone number is 776-0441 if you'd like to call and get our hours, um, see more open. We're, well, we're 9 to 5 Monday through Thursday, 9 to 6 Friday, 9 to 4 on Saturday. Well, thank you, Lori. But we love you. plants there, I know, as you can I tell. Love, <laughs> and I hope the folks out there love plants, too. And we really thank you for coming and being with us. Making It Grow is brought to you in part by Santee Cooper, South Carolina's state-owned electric and water utility. More information on green power and energy conservation programs online at SanteeCooper.com. The South Carolina Department of Agriculture, reminding you that certified South Carolina agricultural products help make South Carolina grow. McLeod Farms in Macby, South Carolina. This family farm offers seasonal produce, including over 22 varieties of peaches. Glory Foods, celebrating Southern food with a soulful heritage. Glory Foods, a way of inviting South Carolina back to the dinner table. FTC Diversified, a proud part of your local communities, providing communication, entertainment, and security. Art Fields, a 10-day art competition in Lake City, South Carolina. Additional funding provided by International Paper.